Why hello there friends, it's Eva here, the bookish princess. As we prepare to enter a new year, I thought I would take a look back at my reading in 2020 and share my top favorites. We're gonna go through 20 books every year for the past six years. I've done my top favorites and I've always done the number to match the year, 15 for 2015, 18 for 2018. So I thought I would continue the tradition. We'll do 20 for 2020. Let's get into it. So quite a few of my books were ebooks, which is why I don't have um, a very large stack here. This is not in any particular order. It is nice to have 20 books on the list because then I can include things that maybe they weren't like the best book I've ever read, but it really added a lot of enjoyment to my year. It was a really compelling story, made me think about things in a new light. I did pick a quote that stood out to me from each of these books, so let's get started. The unconscious, lately discovered by Professor Freud and used by others to store their joys, fears, and frustrations, was for Noreen a gigantic subterranean wardrobe. If you've been keeping up with my reading vlogs this year, then you'll know I've read some Eva Ibbotson books, which were just a sheer delight. The one that I picked for this list was Magic Flutes, but it was kind of a toss-up. I also really loved um, The Morning Gift. That quote was actually about the villain, but Eva Ibbotson does a pretty good job of making her villains kind of relatable um, and likable to a certain extent. Her heroines you just want to be best friends with. They're so full of life, full of personality, just interested in everything in the world around them. Tessa, or Poot Serral, is the heroine of Magic Flutes, and she loves the opera, so she becomes an assistant for basically no pay, insane hours, but she's just immersed in the life of this opera in Vienna. But Tessa has a secret. She is actually an Austrian princess. Her family has fallen on hard times, and they have to sell their ancestral castle. The hero, Guy, who also has so much character, it's so fun to hear him described, he purchases the castle, and he hires an opera, which happens to be Prozzerl's opera, to come and give a performance there. The setting is amazing, this incredible castle, the characters are so full of life. I love the way the plot unfolds, the surprises, the romance. Eva Ibbotson does a great job with like really memorable scenes. All right, let's see what's next. In the depth of your hopes and desires lies your silent knowledge of the beyond. And like seeds dreaming beneath the snow, your heart dreams of spring. Trust the dreams, for in them is hidden the gate to eternity. Your fear of death is but the trembling of the shepherd when he stands before the king, whose hand is to be laid upon him in honor. Is the shepherd not joyful beneath his trembling that he shall wear the mark of the king? Yet is he not more mindful of his trembling? This was not my first time reading The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, but it was my first time um, rereading it in a few years. And it's just such a wonderful work to rediscover all the beautiful lines and images. It's really poetry. The Prophet gives reflections on all these different topics, beauty, death, joy, sorrow. Every time I reread this, I think a different line stands out to me. It makes you look at something familiar um, in a new light. It's a fairly slim volume, so it's a relatively quick read, but it definitely goes deep. As to Bettina, around her was a maddening world, an orgy of admiration. Such fortune, such beauty. Miss Percival arrived in Paris on the 15th of April. A fortnight had not passed before the offers of marriage began to pour upon her. In the course of that first year, she might, had she wished it, have been married 34 times and to what a variety of suitors. So I went to an antique store at the beginning of uh, 2020 and there was this box of books that a whole bunch of them stood out to me. They just all seemed like authors and stories that I would really enjoy. And they were also just beautiful, gorgeous old books with lovely covers. Two of them have made their way onto my top reads of the year. That quote I just read is from the Abbe Constantin by Ludovic Halevé. So this is set in France. There are two American women who um, end up buying a castle in France. They're millionaires now, but they came from a very humble beginning. So they enjoy kind of the whirl and gaiety of Paris, um, but they're also very grounded. And it's so lovely to hear about the whole community um, and village near the castle that they buy. The book is actually named after the village priest, the Abbe Constantin. His adopted son, Sub-Lieutenant Jean Renaud, 
uh, is the hero of the book. You can see um, the cover of this book is just so lovely and it's just as delightful on the inside. It's like a delicious French pastry of a book. So charming. From the distaff of eternity you take the thread of your life, but you're sitting in the night and God meant you to be a spinner in the sun. When the day breaks for you, you'll be finding the loose link to set yourself free. Another book that I found at that antique store and really enjoyed was A Spinner in the Sun by Myrtle Reed. This is the same author who wrote Arsenic and Old Lace, which was turned into a kind of famous film. I don't think I've ever seen that and I haven't read that book. But this was a really lovely book. As you can kind of tell from the quote, it is about a woman who life has kind of passed her by and she's gone through a lot of dark times. After many years, uh, she returns to her home and of course everything is dusty and cobwebbed and that's a metaphor for her own um, mental state and there are some painful associations still in her uh, hometown. But she meets some new friends and she finds the worth of old friends and learns the importance of forgiveness and finds that new starts are possible for her even though she's kind of given up on it. Some great characterization in here, a great plot twist. I'm so glad I discovered Myrtle Reed. I only wish I had bought more of the books from that box at that antique store because clearly whoever whoever's library they came from, we had the same tastes. With the aurora borealis flaming coldly overhead or the stars leaping in the frost dance and the land numb and frozen under its pall of snow, the song of the huskies might have been the defiance of life, only it was pitched in a minor key with long drawn wailings and half sobs and was more the pleading of of life, the articulate travail of existence. It was an old song, old as the breed itself, one of the first songs of the younger world in a day when songs were sad. It was invested with the woe of unnumbered generations, this plaint by which Buck was so strangely stirred. It was the cover that drew me uh, into The Call of the Wild by Jack London. I love my Penguin English Library paperbacks. You can see them um, stacked up there. And I'm so glad I added this one to my collection this year. During the first few chapters, I wasn't sure I was going to get into this book because it's told from the perspective of Buck the dog. Um, and it's pretty brutal the way um, his journey uh, into the Yukon starts. But then once the story picks up and Buck kind of gets into the groove of his new life, you get these beautiful descriptions descriptions and beautiful reflections of Buck reconnecting kind of with his his long lineage answering the call of the wild. I'm entitled to nine names as I've nine lives, said the cat, but I'll settle for Lieutenant Willow with puss for playful moments. I have two dog books on my list this year, which I would not necessarily have expected, but I read 101 Dalmatians by Dodie Smith for this year's Boo To You Readathon. It's been a long time since I watched the Disney movie, so I didn't remember a lot of the specifics, the starlight barking, and all of the dogs and cats and humans, their pets, the pets of the pets, are so much fun to meet, and Dodie Smith just has such a quirky sense of humor. It makes me want to read more of her books. Um, because it just, it reminded me a little bit of Mary Poppins by P.L. Travers. Obviously I love the Disney uh, retellings of many of these old tales, but it's so much fun to go back and read the original. We sometimes live to 300 years, but when we cease to exist here, we only become the foam on the surface of the water, and we have not even a grave down here of those we love. We have not immortal souls, we shall never live again, but like the green seaweed when once it has been cut off, we can never flourish more. Human beings, on the contrary, have a soul which lives forever, lives after the body has been turned to dust. It rises through the pure, clear air beyond the glittering stars. As we rise out of the water and behold all the land of the earth, so do they rise to unknown and glorious regions which we shall never see. I had a pretty good Boo to You readathon this year because several of the books I read um, in October for the readathon have made it onto this list. The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen was quite a quick read. It's just a short fairy tale, but it was my first time reading it and it was just so lovely, so otherworldly, really magical and mysterious to enter into the world of the mermaids, to go under the sea, and again, fun to chart the differences and similarities between the original and the Disney version. It's a little bit of a melancholy tale, but there's also a lot of beauty in it. And it's told in a very sort of lyrical, poetic way. Now that I have the fairy tales of Hans Christian Andersen on my Kindle, it's definitely on my list to read more of them. I have studied many times the marble which was chiseled for me, a boat with a furled sail at rest in a harbor. In truth, it pictures not my destination, but my life. For love was offered me, and I shrank from its disillusionment. Sorrow knocked at my door, but I was afraid. Ambition called to me, but I dreaded the chances. Yet all the while I hungered for meaning in my life. And now I know that we must lift the sail and catch the winds of destiny wherever they drive the boat. 
To put meaning in one's life may end in madness, but life without meaning is the torture of restlessness and vague desire. It is a boat longing for the sea and yet afraid. My other top read that came from the Bucci Readathon was Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters. My brother Athos suggested this book inspired by The Haunted Mansion because the premise is uh, gravestones in this town of Spoon River. So each kind of poem, sometimes it's inspired by the epitaph on the stone and it's usually the person, the ghost, the happy haunt, not so happy haunt, um, speaking from beyond the grave and telling the story of their life. And since you get stories from the entire town, many of them are woven together. Many of them show you like two totally different pictures of the same series of events. Some really beautiful writing like the quote that I just read. One day, Nigel stood a little way off from his picture and considered it with unusual attention and detachment. He could not make up his mind what he thought about it and wished he had some friend who would tell him what to think. What he would have liked at that moment would have been to see himself walk in, slap himself on the back and say, with obvious sincerity, absolutely magnificent, I see exactly what you are getting at, do get on with it and don't bother about anything else. This year I did a live stream book club and we discussed Leaf by Nickel by J.R.R. Tolkien. I had read this in the past, but again, it had been a while since I reread it. And it's such a gem. It's about this artist, Nickel, who is working on a picture and we see his progress on the picture during his life and after his life, after death. It's beautiful and inspiring and funny. Of course, I love Tolkien's Lord of the Rings um, series as well, but Leaf by Nickel is another old friend that it's fun to come back to. The thing you must always trust about Sienna is her creativity. She can create the new and beautiful. One always trusts the truly creative. Even the machinations of the Ixians? That is not creative. You always know the creative because it is revealed openly. Concealment betrays the existence of another force entirely. I've been getting through God Emperor of Dune this year. This is the fourth in the Dune series. I still think the original uh, Dune is best and then I did enjoy the second which was Dune Messiah. Children of Dune kind of lost me. I had to take a break after that, but I am really glad I picked up the series again. In the original Dune and in all the sequels, there's such a sense of like the future being just as important as the present. So it is exciting to get to see uh, what is happening in that future and to learn a little bit more about the golden path and what it entails. But there is still a sense of mystery and of questions approached but unanswered. It took me a while to get through this one. I do see still have two Dune sequels uh, waiting for me, so next year I'll have to start on those. The great thing I am sure is not to be nervous about God, not to try and shut out the Lord Emmanuel from any sphere of truth. Art is not he. We must not substitute art for God. Yet this also is he, for it is one of his images and therefore reveals his nature. Here we see in a mirror darkly. We behold only the images. Elsewhere we shall see face to face in the place where image and reality are one. I spent a lot of time with Dorothy Sayers this year. I reread the Lord Peter series, which I absolutely love. They are such delightful uh, mysteries. It's like you mix Sherlock Holmes with Bertie Wooster, and the result is a win. But it had always been on my list to read some of Dorothy Sayers' nonfiction. So this is Letters to a Diminished Church, Passionate Arguments for the Relevance of Christian Doctrine. I really can't recommend this enough. I probably should have ordered this list and like kept my favorites for last, but this is definitely up there in like the top, top of my 2020 reads. I believe these are mostly lectures um, that Dorothy Sayers delivered on different themes related to Christian doctrine, creed or chaos, strong meat, the other six deadly sins, the Faust legend and the idea of the devil. The same good sense and depth of thought that you see in Lord Peter really come to the fore um, in Letters to a Diminished Church. I just love the way she lays things out. Definitely a book I'll be rereading. There are movements of the soul deeper than words can describe and yet more powerful than any reason that can give a man to know beyond question or arguing or doubt that digitus dei est hic, the finger of God is here, and the name of that reality is grace. God does inspire men by his grace, does lift the heart, does enlighten the mind and move the will. Faith is required to accept that reality, but it is a reality nonetheless. Only in the decision to go on to Russia did I find the joy and the interior peace that are marks of God's true intervention in the soul, and so to Russia I would go. I got to know Father Walter Chiswick this year. This is He Leadeth Me, an extraordinary testament of faith. Father Walter Chiswick was a Roman Catholic priest. As you could hear in the quote, he just felt this really strong call to go to Russia and minister to the people there. Sp spent 23 years in the Soviet Gulag. There's also a book with God in Russia that details kind of more of the specific 
specifics of his experience, but this is really um, a spiritual reflection on his life and on those experiences. His reliance on God and his honesty about all the struggles that he went through is just really inspiring and beautiful to read about. There was another quote where he said when he woke up in the morning, he would try to, st he would try to say to God, I'm at your disposal today, which I just thought was really a good prayer to start the day with. Followers of Jesus then must get used to living with a form of theological jet lag. The world all around is still in darkness, but they have set their clocks for a different time zone. It is already daytime on their worldview clock, and they must live as daytime people. I read the biography Paul by N.T. Wright this year about, of course, St. Paul the Apostle. I knew his story, of course, the road to Damascus. At first he persecuted the early Christians, but then he was inspired to become one of them. But this biography was so fascinating. It really gave you a lot of details, placing the letters of St. Paul, the epistles. I've heard at mass every Sunday, placing them kind of in historical context, placing them in the context of Paul's life. And the author clearly has a lot of sympathy for Paul and so does a really beautiful job kind of trying to imagine his point of view and write about not just the things he did, but why he did what he did and what his personality was like and how that played into his faith and his mission. It seems like St. Paul was really quite the character. So it was really amazing to get to know him and his life better. Christmas was approaching rapidly and so was the Christmas entertainment at Drumberley School. It was a very interesting performance, so Rhoda thought. And as she watched the well-known story unfold, she wondered what Mr. William Shakespeare would have thought if he were a member of the audience. Would he have been annoyed at the liberties which had been taken with his work by Mr. Grieg? It was quite cleverly done, however. The story hung together and was intelligible. So perhaps Mr. Shakespeare would not have taken exception to the presentation. Parts of the play were excruciatingly funny and Rona had difficulty in stifling her amusement. But now and again there was a magical feeling in the air and for a few moments you were lifted out of, out of your surroundings and transported to medieval Venice by the master's hand. You were lifted and transported and then suddenly you came down with a thump and found yourself sitting in a crowded hall watching a group of children waiting doggedly through a play whose inner meaning they could never understand. <laughs> D.E. Stevenson is a regular on my top reads of the year lists. This year I read Winter and Rough Weather for the first time. Many of D.E. Stevenson's uh, books are s roughly a series, like they follow the same kind of family and character. So this uh, actually goes together with Victoria Cottage, Music in the Hills, um, and then this is kind of the third in the series. Really, they're all delightful, so you have no reason not to read the entire trilogy. Um, and there is kind of a mystery that's set up in Music in the Hills that is resolved in uh, Winter and Rough Weather. But I think this was probably my favorite. I just loved the heroine, Rhoda, um, and how she's adjusting to her new surroundings in Scotland. She lives on the hill farm of Vosgath in the Scottish borders, and the description of winter there is so beautiful. Also the description of the people who live there going to going to the play at the school and how Rhoda helps with that. I thought that was a funny description because whenever you have a movie or a play or something that was inspired by a great author, it's, it's always interesting to see the changes that happen and like sometimes they work and sometimes they don't and you wonder what Shakespeare, what the original author would have thought. If you've read D.E. Stevenson but you haven't read this trilogy yet, I would definitely pick it up. About your depression, Faith, dear, said Lady B, tactfully changing the subject. I suggest that you paint the stairs or turn out a cupboard. It's an almost certain cure. <laughs> I read Henrietta's War by Joyce Dennis this year, set during World War II. I read a number of books set during World War II this year. I felt like they were kind of appropriate, like the, the acknowledgement of the darkness in the world and like the determination to get through difficult times. Henrietta's War was full of that, but also full of humor and relatable moments. It's told in a series of letters from Henrietta to an old school friend who's serving in the armed forces. I absolutely love British literature like this. I feel like it's great uh, comfort reading, but it also has these nuggets of wisdom and inspiration. Men had died and died gladly, not so much for the truth of their faith, which might be proved false by the ears, as for their right to think and test and seek and find, and hold what they had found, that made them men. If man had not got that right, then there was no hope for him. He would never fight his way back to the ultimate truth that he had lost. There were no real victories except the victories of the spirit. Such a victory as that of Greece over Rome, when the mind of the conqueror was in turn conquered by the culture of his slave or as that of Socrates drinking the hemlock and Christ upon the cross. These were the victories that outlasted the centuries. All the others turned to dust and ashes. 
Elizabeth Googe is another British author who usually finds her way onto these top reads of the year lists. This was my first time reading The Castle on the Hill, which is again um, a World War II story. It just has such beautiful kind of spiritual insight and describes these spiritual thoughts and struggles of her characters so precisely and vividly. You do still have delightful characters, funny scenes, wonderful communities that you get to know. Elizabeth Googe also often goes really deep into the history of a place or like the families that live in that place. So the castle on the hill is itself a personality and hearing about all the different personalities who helped build that castle. Definitely worth picking up. I can easily suppose that your six weeks here will be fully occupied were it only in lengthening the waists of your gowns. I have pretty well arranged my spring and summer plans of that kind and mean to wear out my spotted muslin before I go. You may exclaim at this, but mine really has shown signs of feebleness, which with a little care may come to something. I'm pretty sure that Jade Austen's letters have featured on my top reads of the year uh, list in the past, but I think it was like five years ago. So I feel like I'm safe in, in, in featuring it once again. I just love rereading um, these letters. Definitely have to use the footnotes because they're full of like family gossip and like inside jokes that sometimes there's a note explaining it and sometimes there is no note explaining it. The context has just been lost because it's, you know, two sisters writing to each other. Most of these letters are from Jane Austen to her sister Cassandra. I feel like Cassandra gave us a gift in leaving us these letters. Cassandra, of course, did destroy a whole bunch of them, but honestly, it's like sort of text messages between your family. Like, does, does posterity really have a right to that? The novels that Jane Austen gave us were so beautiful and so perfectly crafted. Like, that already was a gift she gave to the world. I don't feel like we have the right to demand all of her personal um, papers and all of her private jokes with her family as well. So I think whatever Cassandra wanted to destroy, she had the absolute right to destroy. But the fact that she did leave so many for us to enjoy and for us to kind of enter into their private jokes and enter into their their family squabbles and their neighborhood gossip you hear the same voice that you hear in Jane Austen's novels too and there are definitely scenes that you think did that did that inspire something in in Pride and Prejudice or in Persuasion it's like sitting down and having a chat with a friend okay I have to consult my list because I think we're approaching the end you have gone abroad on the wings of worldly delight and have seen and known for yourself what part have I had in it pray you say that you have dreamed a dream of mortal life upon the wheel, and that now you think the two to be different, the world and the dream itself. But that is not so. If you think it is so, it will show that you are not yet awakened from your sleep. Master Chang became a butterfly, and the butterfly became Master Chang. Was Chang's becoming a butterfly a dream, or was the butterfly's becoming Chang a dream? You, Song Jin, now think yourself reality and your past life a dream only. You do not reckon yourself one and the same as the dream. Which shall I label the dream? You, Song Jin, or you, so you? I read The Cloud Dream of the Nine by Kim Man Young this year. This is a classic of Korean literature. I've really gotten um, fascinated by Korean culture and history. The group BTS started me down this path and it's just been such a delight. The Cloud Dream of the Nine is so lyrical and poetic because you have this dual existence of the main character. He starts kind of in the land of the spirits and then is uh, cast into the mortal world along with these eight fairies and their fates are tied together so they meet up again in the mortal world. They had such beautiful evocative names. One of the um, fairies was named Cloudlet, which I just thought was so beautiful. I've enjoyed a lot of Korean and Chinese um, dramas. This year I've been watching Yangtze Palace. It's kind of like a Chinese Downton Abbey where like the details and the costumes and the sets are so stunning but like the plot is also incredibly dramatic about, you know, life in the Forbidden City. Some of the other series I've watched, Ashes of Love, that deals with fairies and spirits and some of them being sent to the mortal world. Also The Princess Wei Young. If you're looking for something new to watch, any of those three would be excellent, although I think Yangtze Palace might be my favorite. But anyway, it was fun having watched those to read The Cloud Dream of the Nine because some of the themes and, and you know, settings were, were a little similar, so it really helped you um, picture all the action. I love how the characters are all such great writers and artists and musicians, like they're constantly, you know, writing a beautiful poem that impresses the king or the emperor. And I actually found um, a free ebook of The Cloud Dream of the Nine um, on Google Books. Good tip. 
Life is a chaplet of little miseries which the philosopher counts with a smile. Be philosophers as I am, gentlemen. Sit down at the table and let us drink. Nothing makes the future look so bright as surveying it through a glass of Chambertin. <laughs> I felt like that quote was a pretty good summation of The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. It is grand, swashbuckling adventures in the French court. Of course, you have the musketeers, you have the evil cardinal, you have the beautiful queen, you have the hilarious escapades of Aramis, Athos, Porthos, and D'Artagnan. It's a farce, it's an adventure, it can be philosophical. There are so many great descriptive passages and so many like funny scenes. It feels a little bit like a movie listening to it. It just paints such a great picture of the personalities of the characters and all the action. She had a book of the Gospels beautifully adorned with gold and precious stones and ornamented with the figures of the four evangelists painted in gilt. She had always felt a particular attachment for this book, more so than for any of the others which she usually read. It happened that as the person who carried it was once crossing a ford, he let the book, which had been carelessly folded in a wrapper, fall into the middle of the river. Unconscious of what had occurred, the man quietly continued his journey, but when he wished to produce the book, suddenly it dawned upon him that he had lost it. Long was it sought, and nowhere could it be found. At last it was discovered, lying open at the bottom of the river. Its leaves had been kept in constant motion by the action of the water. Who would fancy that the book could afterwards be of any value? Who would believe that even a single letter would have been visible? Yet of a truth, it was taken up out of the middle of the river, so perfect, so, unearned, so uninjured, so free from damage, that it did not seem to even have been touched by the water. I've always loved St. Margaret of Scotland, and I knew a little bit about the story of her life, but I never sat down and read a biography of her. And this year, I finally got to The Life of St. Margaret by Bishop Turgot. So this was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago because Bishop Turgot actually knew her. I'm just so glad I finally got to it. And it's so cool to read like an account by someone who actually knew a figure from the past. And it's so cool to read these words from so many centuries ago. It's really like time time travel. There were little anecdotes that helped you get to know um, Queen Margaret, and I just loved how one of the miracles um, associated with her is a bookish miracle, that her beautiful gospel book was not destroyed um, when it was lost in the river. I wish that would happen to my books, because I have a couple volumes that I've left by an open window and then it rained, but they weren't really readable after that. <laughs> well, there we have it, 20 books to sum up my 2020 reading year. Looking back over my most memorable reads from 2020 has been so much fun. I'd love to hear it from you guys in the comments down below. What are some books that you read this past year that helped you or stood out in your mind? Are there any books in particular on your list that you're hoping to get to in the new year? If you're looking for even more inspiration, you can check out some of my past um, top reads of the year videos. I'll leave them linked in the description below. You can also check out my reading vlogs. I did manage to do um, a reading wrap up for every month and there were some fun live streams in there. Thank you guys so much for following along this year. If you're not yet, make sure you're subscribed so you can stay tuned for more bookish adventures in 2021. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. I wish you a very, very happy new year. I'll talk to you again soon and until then I hope you have a magical and a bookish day. Bye guys!